Greetings, ladies and metal gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space, where I take stories from across the internet and read them for your entertainment. This particular story is called Intergalactic Master, written by Battlelox underscore. One hundred human years ago, humanity exploded onto the galactic scene, settling system after system until they had filled out their borders as much as any of the other unified species empires. And then... They just kind of stopped. That's not unusual, really. As much as we love stories of interstellar wars and extragalactic threats to the very existence of life, well, those things don't really happen. Humanity stopped because they started to butt up against their neighbors, and rather than risk open conflict, their neighbors took their quarrels and their border skirmishes, and they went to the Galactic Castle to settle tensions diplomatically. That's the way it is done, and the way that it's been done for cycles and cycles and cycles. It happened before humanity rose to prominence and, divines willing, it'll happen long after they and us and most other extant species fade from this plane. We are a static galaxy. Life is ultimately quite dull unless you're one of the poor louts on a colony or industrial world when the smallest accidents can destroy entire settlements. Only the smallest new empires like the humans are ever even at risk of being conquered, and no one dared touch them. War was simply not the answer. So we find other ways to cope with time. Some, like the Felaron, press the boundaries of technology. Their children dream of cracking the next big breakthrough that'll cause a revolution. In my humble opinion, their hopes are in somewhat vain. Technology is progressing exponentially slower as we push the limits of what is even physically possible. Others, including the Koch's people and the Plenth's collective, strive for cultural growth and philosophical enlightenment. They find depth and meaning in blank white squares and hyper-postmodern analysis of whatever discordant sounds they call music these days. Their greatest thinkers spend half their lives in a biosuit, floating about in the cold vacuum of space in search of answers. As for myself, and well, the rest of the galaxy, we find our time is most enjoyably wasted by sport. By happy coincidence and the pressures of evolution, most intelligent species find themselves surprisingly capable of playing the sports of other species. In fact, some have even surpassed the creators of the sport in skill and capability. After all, who can forget the 37,600 galactic Quidditch finals where the Centasis' flying box beat the human island's team 1,090 to 150. Granted, there are some exceptions. As it turns out, few species are skilled at decaball played by the ten-armed Baldrus, since few species have ten arms and can withstand being tackled by a 15-ton Baldrus whose exoskeleton is primarily composed of iron. I consider myself quite an aficionado of eccentric sports, and I barely escaped my only game of decaball of my life. But generally speaking, the rest are quite enjoyable for almost any species. Like I said, I'm rather a connoisseur of the sporting genre. Pick a species and I'll tell you their favorite game, reigning champion, and how many limbs you need to get involved. I have even played most of them, or at least most of the ones I can play. I've gathered wins in sports as diverse as Kalsa, Football, Sasasa, the other football, Jalaya, 10-2 come 6 poker, and even the barely legal war games on the outer rim. You'll notice that many human sports appear on the list, as you might have figured by the introductory paragraph of this piece. I have an odd affinity for human sports and games. It seems as though they've just dedicated far more of their time to creating and mastering otherwise useless sports than most other species would bother with. Hell, at one point in their history, they had entire stadiums full of people watching ground cars drive in a circle. They didn't even fly them. They created two football games, baseball, basketball, Jill Ally, Botashi, lacrosse, Calcio Ferentino, curling, rugby, bowling, tennis, table tennis, badminton, hockey, discus, pole vaulting, skiing, target shooting, archery target shooting, luge, car racing, foot racing, bike racing, water racing, and more. And that's not even including the vast library of less physical games like board games or virtual games. I've played them all, every last one. I've won most of them too, or at least gotten close. But there is one human sport that remains infamous to this day throughout the galaxy. You see, when a game like a deck of ball pops up, we sporting fans take it as a challenge. 
we do our damnedest to put together a team that can win it according to the rules of the game. That one game of Deckerball I barely survived. We won that game and only suffered one hospitalization. It was the first alien team to win at Deckerball, but we did it. The humans, however, don't get by on strength or size or toughness. Their unbeatable sport does not require brawn or finesse or even quick reaction times. You don't fight, throw, kick, catch or run. You simply sit in a chair, stare at an 8x8 checkered board, and you think as if your life depended on it. And yet, despite our best efforts, we have never beaten a human at chess. That's right, never. Granted, I'm sure they're not sending their dumbest players, just as the Baldrus don't send egglings in a game of Decker Ball. Regardless, it is an absolute embarrassment for the galactic community. The rules, while abstract, are far from the most complicated in existence. But there's just something about those humans, something about planning so far ahead in the game that they know what move you're going to make before you do, and they know how to respond to it, and they know how to push you if you don't make that move. The best of the humans are busy thinking about the end of the game before we've even finished considering the first. You might wonder why I even bothered trying. After all, it's just a game, right? What could possibly be gained from it? Information, you see, is my real trade. You can learn a lot about a species from the way they relax and play sports. The Baldrus are strong, nigh indestructible, but they are slow and methodical and rarely capable of making leaps in thinking. We beat them by being faster and being tactical. Most of the time, when we try to win these esoteric games, tactics are our best friend. So, why is it that our application of tactics fails so strongly against the humans? What quality is it that they have that makes them so inscrutable? How is it that they can fight my species, the paragons of the largest empire in the galaxy, and come away from those border skirmishes with nary a scratch while our superior forces are left reading? We live in a static galaxy. I pray that it will remain that way, at least until we can win a game of chess. End of story. Story number two. Mind of a Matter, written by Random3x. Human, I am saddened by how weak your race's mental capability are, Rock said as he sat down in the seat opposite him. Who starts a conversation like that? Jack replied, looking up from his lunch at the Quixness colleague. It is the truth, though, and in truth, there is beauty. I think you're underestimating how powerful the human mind truly is, Jack replied, looking back at the alien that had three brain cases displaying their multi-cerebral system. Oh, how so? Hmm. Jack hummed to himself in thought as he tried to recall some of the things humans can do thanks to their minds. I know, uniforms. Uniforms? Rox repeated, confused. Yes. The little thing that we humans have, you know how on some planets we've landed on, you saw humans wearing the same clothes, Rox nodded. Well, those are called uniforms, and they denote a job. People who wear them can cause behavioral changes in the humans around them, even if they do not actually have the authority of that position. Human, that is merely a plumage display, not a power of the mind. If anything, it speaks to the weakness of your species' mind. I was more thinking of the physiological side of things. Ah, have you ever heard of the placebo effect then? Rox shook his head to indicate no. It is a fascinating trick that we humans can do. You see, if you can convince a person a certain physiological change will occur, their belief can actually make it happen. Seriously? You just... No, really. There was one study where people, after an operation, were given painkillers, but some were given placebos. They were given these flowers? No. It's also a name of a fake medicine. The patients were told they would help relieve the pain. I assume the ones taking the fake medicine suffered more. No. They reported feeling reduced pain. To bring it back to my first point, one version of the study had a robot provide the medicine and another a human wearing a doctor's uniform. The one who took it from the human reported far more reduction in pain than the robot. Interesting. Though these only occur due to outside influences, well, 
It is this odd condition where a person is so convinced that they are pregnant that they'll show all the signs despite not being pregnant. Interesting, yes. I will concede that much, but uh, where is the practical use, say, in an emergency? Can this placebo effect draw powers in time of need? No, Jack replied, shaking his head. For that, we have something called hysterical strength. You have a name for a power that you gain through your mind. Well, to be fair, it's more our mind letting go of control. You see these, Jack said, flexing his arm to show off what little muscle a desk jockey like him had. These muscles are exceedingly strong, like ridiculously strong, but our bodies can't actually handle their full strength, so our brains put a limiter on them. Your own singular brain limits your body? Mox asked, confused. Part of his species' nature was developing multiple brains to handle more of their body inputs. Yes, but in times of extreme stress. The famous example is a woman seeing their child crushed under a great weight. It's in an emergency. The brain recognizes the need to lift the limiter, and even a small human can lift several tons. Several tons, yes. Of course, it'll shatter our bones and tear our ligaments, but that's just humanity for you. We will sacrifice ourselves to save those who we care for. Oh, I see. And all humans can do this. Well, it is an exceptional circumstance, but we all have the potential. You remember when Nikki was electrocuted and launched across the hangar? Rox nodded. That was the electricity activating all these muscles and launching him. That is what we could do if we could endure it. Well, now your race just feels scary. No wonder why you became the third dominant species after cats and dogs. Wait, what was that about cats and dogs? End of story. I would quickly like to thank our tier 5 patrons. Dragzoon, WRE, Quantum Wednesday, Ambrose Catull, Lord Azrakul, Bushmaster177, Casper Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, and Arcadian. Thank you very much.